Welcome, everybody, to the Friday edition, January 28th edition of the broadcast. And yes, I know we're going on a little early, but it's a really special night, and you'll know why here in just a second. You can visit our website at lightingthevoid.com. You can listen to this show on iTunes Radio, TuneIn, Spreaker, and you can listen on the call-in line as well. Uh, which we'll announce that if things get too full. So we got all kinds of platforms to listen on. And before we open the phones up, I'm not even going to take a break uh, and bring the guest in because there's a lot of material. We're bringing Daniel Joseph back. And for any of you guys that don't know about Daniel Joseph, he's the author of Swimming with the Whale. And in my opinion, he's the true definition of a true seeker and a student of Doskalos and Brother of the Light. And it's uh, the teachings that he talks about are really a diamond in the rough. But he is not only an author, but a direct student of the famous mystic and healer, Dr. Stylianus Ateshlis, better known as Daskalos, who taught circles of students techniques of hidden methods that can be traced back at least 2,000 years. And so he's going to be talking about some of those teachings tonight, and some of his group is going to be asking him direct questions and uh, you might actually learn about the meditations that can get you started on the way to becoming aware of the truth of who you are and what you're capable of. These questions and teachings are based on the books by Daskalos and also Daniel's book, which is Swimming with a Well. If uh, you want to get caught up after this show, there are two other shows that we did with Daniel, and you can check those out on all the podcast networks, Google Play, doesn't matter. Follow us on Facebook, by the way, at Lighting the Void on Facebook and at Lighting the Void on Twitter. And uh, we're going to go ahead and just bring Daniel on and because we got a lot of material to cover. So, Daniel, how are you doing this evening, man? It's really awesome to have you back. Good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Joseph. Man, it is my, my pleasure. you got something big coming up in uh, Arizona. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, we're doing a a seminar in Sedona on March 19th through the 23rd. And it's all going to be about how to become whole and healthy, both physically, emotionally, and mentally. So we'll be looking at things like what's happiness, what's unhappiness. And we're going to introduce a happiness meditation from Dasklos. It's not been released to the public yet. We're going to explain the dynamics of healing, what it really is, and that is a restoration of balance. And we'll teach some of the healing methods and practices of the Daskalos and the researchers of truth, how to use these safe methods for ourselves and for others in need. But, of course, you know, when you're talking about healing, we first have to understand what is the cause of accidents and illness. And these causes include karmic causes from this life or a past one, and we give a special kind of meditation for burning off karmic debts in this seminar. The causes of illness also include energetic causes, and we're going to give meditations on how to prevent these kind of illnesses. And these causes also include something that's kind of hard to understand, and these are the trials of initiation that involve accidents and illnesses as tests. You know, if you look at the immense suffering of Christ, one might be tempted to think he had the worst karma ever, but of course that's not the case. Or take the Christian saint, Lawrence, who around like 20, 250 A.D., he was a very pure lover of God, and he was captured by the Romans. And in their great anger to annihilate Christians, they sentenced him to a very cruel death. They literally put him over a low-burning fire and slowly cooked him to death. But apparently he was so empowered by his connection with God that he must not have felt the flames too much, because he even joked with his judge and executioners during the ordeal saying, 
turn me over. I'm done on this side. And just before he died, he's reported to have said, it's cooked enough. Was such a cruel death only caused by his bad karma? Then you look at Daskalos' life. He, He literally spent over 75 years healing, teaching the truth, and doing so many good works. Yet he was slandered by the priests in the uh, Cyprus church who tried unsuccessfully to excommunicate him, which is a really big deal in the old world Cyprus. He was attacked by a demon materialized by a black magician. He was stabbed by another black magician. He was shot with a shotgun. Was this all caused by Daskalos bad karma? Of course not. Now, one time his leg became gangrene up to the knees, and the doctors wanted to amputate it. And I want to tell this story because it reveals so much about how karma and mercy works. And the story starts with Daskalos' nephew, who had a son born with both legs fused to his chest. And the doctors at that time in Cyprus couldn't fix it. So every few weeks, Daskalos worked on the child and very slowly over time managed to free the legs and the baby became eventually all right. And Daskalos became the, the godfather of the little boy. However, Daskalos reports the first time Daskalos held the baby, he recalled a past life with the spirit soul of that baby. It was many centuries ago, and the child had been a sailor. And in that life, a sailor had a very bitter life experience of betrayer, betrayal. And he negatively reacted to it by joining a group of Byzantine pirates and soon became like the dread pirate to the Byzantine Navy and other ships. So at some point in his infamous career, the pirate captured a ship on which uh, the 16-year-old son of an important Italian was on his way to Constantinople. The 16-year-old boy was a previous incarnation of Daskalos' spirit soul. Long story short, the pirate in that incarnation, or in that lifetime, had killed this previous incarnation of Daskalos' spirit soul by stabbing it with many swords, stabbing the boy with many swords. So very soon after the healing of the child, Daskalos was walking back from the stoa where he taught. He made a step, and all of a sudden he felt a sharp pain in his leg, just like a snap or something. When he got inside the house, he took his shoe off, and his foot was black. When he saw it, he realized what had happened. He had taken on the karma of that child. So his daughter, Irina, took him to the hospital, by which time the gangrene had reached up his leg to his knee, and the chief surgeon said it had to be amputated the next day. Daskalo said, okay. But the same afternoon, he told the doctor that he needed some time to meditate. So as he sat alone in the hospital room, understanding the nature of what had happened to him, he smiled and addressed God, saying, in his mind, if you think I'm going to beg you to save my leg, I'm not. This is my leg, and it is your leg. If you think it should be cured, then let it be cured. If you think it should be cut off, then let it be cut off. Now, can you imagine having that level of obedience to God's will? That's, that's a well, the moment power. he finished his little prayer, <clears throat> it is amazing. Test. It's just, and the moment he finished the prayer, he felt a gentle breeze caressing his face, and he saw an angel at his bedside holding his incapacitated leg in one hand and stroking it with the other. But the angel paid no attention to Daskalos and just stroked the leg. When he was done, the angel disappeared and the gangrene disappeared, except for a small spot which also disappeared within 24 hours. So the next morning, the doctors came in to take him to surgery to amputate the leg. And of course, we were dumbfounded, just totally speechless. So later, when Daskalos was baptizing the baby, the baby grabbed Daskalos' finger and would not let go and kept crying and looking in Daskalos' eyes. And when he held the baby close to his face, or close up, the baby put his lips against Daskalos' cheek. And the father said that was the first time he'd ever seen the baby kiss anyone. Now, just think about this. In one lifetime, Daskalos was brutally killed by this fellow. And in a future lifetime, Daskalos healed the fellow and became his godfather in Christ. So after the show tonight, I would just like everybody to 
contemplate this, about how how the karma and mercy worked in this case. And I, I know this sounds pretty far out, but when you were around Daskalos and witnessed these kinds of wonders and signs firsthand, it helped you understand the laws that made such things possible. It's like when Christ said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But when we watch, you know, witness those kind of things, it certainly helped us believe. <laughs> anyway, these are the kind of things we'll be discussing in the Sedona Seminar. That's a pretty amazing story, Daniel. I mean... And well, I, there's so many. There's yeah. so many like that, and there's so many, you know, we witnessed. You know, this was a longer ago before I came, but they always were going on. And um, he was just that obedient and humble. You know, it, if it was God's will for something to happen to him, he took it. And, of course, that's a, that's a good sign for us. It's a good example for us. That sometimes we have to take, you know, our karma. But like I said, this, this meditation we're going to give is going to help, help you burn off the karma quicker through these meditations. And before we start the questions, I wanted, to, I wanted to share a question I got that came from the Facebook page on the esoteric practices. And this fellow asked a very good question. I'll read it. On the Researchers of Truth website, when you do the first meditation, there's the blue sphere, a rosy pink one, an orange one, and a gold one. In the gates of the light, there are only three. The orange one's not present. In the salt minus group, the emphasis is on breathing, not the spheres themselves. And again, the orange sphere is not present. Also, the spheres are alternated, <clears throat> alternatively referred to as disc and sphere, spheres. I'm just a little confused. That's a very good question, because when you first approach these teachings and you start listening to the teachings and the practices, you think there's inconsistencies, but they're not. Because we get many different exercises with the color lights and centers. Sometimes we add the orange ball because the vibrations of the intense color of orange kills germs and harmful microbes in our blood. And we do this when it's the thyroid because the blood circulates through this center frequently. And we have to remember these visualized exercises are done in our etheric doubles. So when doing the exercise on the etheric double of the material body, we see them as discs because that's how they look at this level. But when we do them on the etheric double of the psychical body, we see them as balls of light, because this is how they look at this level. And at the noetic, noetical level, they also appear as spheres of light, but much, much brighter radiance. And as you proceed with these practices, you will see that some exercises, we see both the disc and the balls together, having the same center point. So there are so many different exercises where these elements are combined in different ways to produce different effects and results. So I just wanted to clear that up because initially that is kind of confusing. We're talking about spheres and discs and these kinds of things. All right. Well, we've got uh, five phone lines open, okay, and they're already uh, they're already filled up for the most part. So. We'll try to get the questions through and, you know, it just keep trying to call. You know, when one person gets done, then we'll move on to the next. We'll try not to uh, throw, you, throw you too much at once here, Daniel. But are you ready to start uh, taking no. questions? Or do you have anything oh, yeah. else you Can want you to talk about? Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. No. That's good. All right. Here we go. Let's see. It looks like uh, 970 area code. Do you have a question for Daniel? Hi, actually, I don't. I just couldn't hear you guys on the radio station. There's somebody else on the radio station. Uh, I just checked it. It's us on the radio station. So you, oh. so you, you can call in. You can go to the you know lightingthevoid.com and hit play, or you can go to the fringe.fm. You can go to uh, tune in and search uh, the fringe.fm or the fringe FM, and you can go to uh, iTunes radio and search KTLK, the fringe FM, or you can call in and listen five, six, three, nine, 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 three, nine, two, one. So yeah, I've checked everything oh, while Daniel was talking. Thank so yeah, it's, thank you. it's all working. You, you don't have a question. That's okay. All right. So we'll, t we'll go to the next caller. Sorry about that guys. Uh, seven, seven, zero area code. Do you have a question for Daniel? Yes, I do. This is George. Uh, hi, Daniel. How are you? Good, George. How are you? 
Good, good. Um, I have two separate questions. Uh, they're probably unrelated. So I'll just ask one, wait for the answer, and then ask the, the next question, which is likely unrelated. It could be related. I'm not sure. Um, but my first question is, um, Vascalos describes us as uh, spirit souls, okay? And I'd like to understand the difference between the spirit and the soul. Um, why are we spirit souls and not just spirits or souls? God is spirit, and we call God absolute infinite beingness because he's composed of the infinite number of spirit beings. And at the very highest level, that is what we are, an eternal spirit being. But this is prior to becoming a human being. There's a process of humanization that's not really been revealed in the spiritual teachings until Daskalos came along. And so what happens is when it's these spirit, eternal spirit beings decide to incarnate, they project a, just a ray of themselves. They're in oneness with God. They're similar to God because they are in oneness with him. So when they decide to project a ray, they project just one ray out. Now, passing through the divine plan, they come to certain archetypes. Now, some of these rays go through, well, they all go through the archangelic archetype. That's the first one. But some of them stop there, and those become the, all, the angel, all, <clears throat> excuse me, all the archangelic orders of all the archangels. Some continue on and pass through the human idea archetype. This is, a, this is an eternal archetypal idea that gives definition to the spirit ray. So now it's defined, and the moment that spirit ray passes through that archetypal idea, it becomes humanized, which is to say the soul is formed. Now is, there's a soul involved. Now it's a soul. And the soul, in turn, projects its ray down into the worlds of existence and through the noetical, the psychical, into material incarnation. It's almost like, as a spirit, eternal being, we got one toe in the water of existence. And that's our lifetime this time. So it's another way he explains it to help you maybe understand it, if you think about a sun and all of these rays coming off the sun, that's like these, these rays coming from the spirit being. And when it comes to your house, it passes through a window. And the window gives shape to that light. And that light falls on the floor and makes that shape on the floor. Now, if the floor represents like our personality, so if the floor is dark, not much light radiates off of it. But if the floor is uh, yellow, then you see some bright brightness come off of it. If it's white, you see a lot of brightness. So these colors on the floor represent the kind of qualities of personality. You know, a really dark, negative person doesn't reflect, doesn't emanate much light, doesn't reflect much light to those around them. But you know, some people doing good. When you do good, you start to have more light in you, so it reflects to those around you. If we could say a white floor would be like a saint. You know, it creates a lot of, reflects a lot of light around them. And then we have to ask the question, what's Christ? Christ is like a crystal clear mirror on that floor. So this is, this is the way it works. And this, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very big study, but that's, uh, that's the answer. So the second question is related then, um, because um, that's where it's hard for me to understand um, that one part of me, the permanent part of me, is with God, it's my spirit, and it's eternal, and, then, and therefore it is saved, I mean, he, it's with God, and then and, and another part of me is here on earth, and maybe doing crimes or whatever it's doing, okay, dark, mm -hmm. light, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. And um, it feels like, first of all, I'm, a di I'm divided, and I'm not aware of my um, other part, so that's hard to, uh, to comprehend how I can be a permanent, per permanently with God, but I have a portion of me that's here, and I'm not even aware of the other part, number one. That's part, one part of the question. And the other one is, um, so I'm in two places at once without any under, uh, you know, awareness of that fact. And the other fact is that, okay, if, my, if only a ray of me is here on earth, but my permanent personality is up there with God, you know, my spirit, then, you know, I'm with God. I mean, really, I mean, at the end of the day, right? 
Um, so what's, what's the significance of my life here? I mean, is it going to take my spirit that's with God and bring it down to hell? Or, you know, if I do terrible crimes here, if my permanent personality is eternal and it's up there with God? Um, I don't know if I express myself clearly, but that's where I'm having a little bit of a confusion. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah, and you hear in spiritual teachings, you know, the inner self, the outer self, the lower mm-hmm. self, the higher self. These are generic references to this. Yes, as a spirit soul being, you've never left God. So you can't say it's saved because it was never lost. But this ray coming down into existence, now it has to go through the law of oblivion and the concept of separation. So as a personality, we feel separate. And that's true. We feel separate, but we're not. If we, if we were actually separate from our spirit soul or from God, we wouldn't even exist any more than a... Uh, cherry blossom on the end of a cherry tree. You can't, it won't blossom unless it's connected to the tree. So in the same way, we're connected to God and our spirit soul all the time. And now, don't think of this as it's dual. I mean, it's, it seems dual, and it, we are in the worlds of duality, so from our perspective, definitely it's dual. But from the perspective of the spirit soul, it's not dual. Because all this is in us. It. You know, as a personality, we live on the earth. But as a spirit soul, the earth lives in us. And that's a hard concept to, to just take initially, but you try to meditate on that. But it's really, there's not quite the separation as, as it appears from our sign. And what's the point of it? I mean, what's the whole point? I mean, if you're this perfect spirit soul in heaven, you know, in, in one minute with God, what is the point of coming down here and suffering all this? Why did we come? Well, the, the point is, the spirit soul knows the truth. It knows the truth. That permanent personality, that inner self, whatever you want to call it, it knows the truth. But it's in need of learning to hold the truth, to live that truth while under the conditions of duality. And this enriches, it doesn't make the soul bigger, but it enriches it with a direct experience. And the analogies given is think of an architect who designs a building he can tell you everything about the building the door handles the shape the rooms he can imagine himself walking through it but to go and build that building totally different experience once he builds the building he really understands the building much much deeper i got you so basically our soul is helping develop our spirit in effect no. In other words, the experiences that we're experiencing here is helping develop uh, the fullness of our spirit, which is permanent. No, the spirit is it's totally full, but it, it lacks the experience of, of living it in the worlds of duality. And by that experience, it enriches the soul. And, and, and the whole story is summed up in the prodigal son. He leaves the father's kingdom. He comes down the worlds of existence. He squanders his money, he suffers, he realizes, gee, I really should, you know, stay in my father's kingdom, and so he returns. But he returns yes, but in the a whole, so the, the, the prodigal son is not divided, it's one person, you know, so he leaves the father, and then squanders the wealth, etc., and then returns as a whole and begs forgiveness, and the father then envelops him, but he was not with the father when he had left. It wasn't a portion of him that left, it was entirely... The whole sun left. Well, it's just a symbolic story, but the point is when he returns, now he's more privileged than the elder, elder brother because sure, now this sure. fellow knows time and space. He knows light and darkness. He knows the worlds of duality. The archangels, they don't ever leave it, so they don't know what evil is. They only, right. When they look at a human being, they only see good. They don't understand evil. So in effect, it helped the spirit, like the fullness of the spirit to get the full experience. The, the prodigal son is more experienced than the son that stayed with God, basically, right? With the father. He under, yeah, he, it's, you can't say that it, that it made the spirit or the soul bigger, better, or more fuller. What you can say is that it gave it the experience of the worlds of duality, which is something the archangels who never left the oneness of God do not have. All right. Yeah, uh, we got. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm 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 understanding, but thank you so much. It's good. I'm going to listen to the to the explanation again and uh, try to fully understand it. Okay. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Sure. Take care.
Take care. All right. Uh, yeah, man, that's a. Uh, when you talk about how some of this stuff is allegorical, I think we forget that sometimes, don't we? Uh, a yeah, little bit, yeah. you know. You know, he's he's trying to explain these high teachings two thousand years ago to people that, you know, he had to use simple metaphors and parables to help them understand. All right, let me see who's been waiting the longest here for you. Oh wow, okay, I got somebody's been on here for twenty six minutes. Uh, four zero four area code. You're speaking with Daniel Joseph. Do you have a question for Daniel? Four zero four area code. Can you hear me? I know you're there. All right, we're gonna have to move on to the next one. I know you've been waiting a long time. That stinks. All right. So yeah, five two zero area code is next. You are on the air with Daniel Joseph. Go ahead. I don't know if these uh you can hear me, right, Daniel? Mm. Well, I can hear you fine. I think some I think I they're uh, some of these people are calling to just listen again. Anyways, let's move on to the next one. Okay, 919 area code. Do you have a question for Daniel? Hello. Oh, sounds like you no. have trouble with your... There was, you go. Well, there yeah, you go. I was doing the same thing. I, I was calling in to listen, but I used this number. Okay, so the the listen line, uh, again, for all you guys, uh, let me tell you what the listen line is. The listen line... <clears throat> let me just pull it back up here. Is uh 563... Nine 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 three nine two one, and you can listen to this show on TuneIn, iTunes Radio. The whole time Daniel's been talking, I've been checking all this stuff to make sure it's working. So it's working. But yeah, you can listen on that listen line. I would keep you in the queue, but I got other okay. callers trying to come in. You know, that's okay. I'll drop off and call in. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see, 615 area code. Do you have a question for Daniel? Yes, is this me, Caroline? Hey, Caroline. Hello. Hi, Hi how are you? Thank you so much. And for everyone who was calling in and then listening, just know I'm the original center on that one because that's what I did last <laughs> the last time <laughs> Daniel was on the program. And I really apologize. It was it was uh, disconcerting for me because I was a little nervous when I when uh, I came back when I was asked to to give a question because I had just called in to listen. Um, so, but I did write down my questions tonight, and I've talked them through quite a bit. And um, Daniel, hello, and thank you so much for coming on again, and thank you so much for having him again. Um, I have a question. It's a pretty basic question. It's important to me. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm sure there's something, I have not read all the way through the Magus of of Stravulus, um, but I'm wondering how, I've I've read so much about it, but I want to know, how does one contact and converse with one's holy guardian angel? And how does one know when one contacts it, if it's actually your holy guardian angel instead of some other sort of entity? That's a good question. Or even an elemental. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, the guardian angel is with all of us. We each have our own, and he's been with us from the beginning of our first incarnation, and he'll stay with us till we return back in oneness with God. So he's with you. So he knows everything you've ever said, everything you've ever felt, everything you've ever thought from every lifetime, and he doesn't forget it. Uh-oh. So he knows you better than any anyone. So this is why Daskalos always declared, you don't need a master. You've got this master in you, this can tell you more than an earthly master can tell you, even allowed to tell you. So once you turn and start to really listen, most people, it's silent because like if you had a child and you, you kept talking to him and he just ignored you all the time, after a while, you're going to stop talking. So it's sort of like that. They, they sort of just get quiet because you're not listening. So what's the point of talking? But when you start to turn and develop and tune into them, then they come forward. And this is a very important point. So, you know, obviously, the way you do it is in meditation. 
And so in, when you're in a quiet space, a deep, quiet space, ask your question and expect an answer. But he doesn't necessarily, and very seldom in my own experience, give you that answer immediately. He might, but most of the time he waits for a really precious opportunity where you really can receive it best, really receptive. Sometimes for me, I'm in the shower. I'm driving in the car. It's sometime when you're almost, your mind's mundane mind is occupied on some main mundane thing, and then you can hear this voice of intuition. And that's what intuition is. It's the voice of the guardian angel. Mm-hmm. So you have to practice. You have to practice this and just try it. And it might take a while, but just ask the question. You have to be very sincere. It can be a, a, you know, a lightweight question. They don't, give, they don't give petty advices. They don't talk about small things. And they don't use a litany of words. It's so succinct. It's just like, wham. It just hits the point just so succinctly. And it, it resonates in you. And after a while, but here's the downside. The moment you start to do this, your egoism is listening and saying, it wants mm. to interfere. It wants to block you because it knows if you listen to the guardian angel, you're going to realize you're not your egotism. And that means its days are numbered. So it tries to block you. It, it tries to pretend. And one of the things it does, it likes to pretend like it's the guardian angel. So it tries mm. to mimic. It's a mimic. So you have to be very, very careful. And in order to do this, you have to be able to discern the difference between the two. And you'll hear both. But over time, you'll get to the point where you can say, oh, clearly that's the guardian angel. Now, it's a little bit like this. Let's say you were blindfolded and three, three women came in the room. One of them is your mother. And each of those women said the same sentence. Would it be hard for you to know which one was your mother? No. No. It's the same like that. Once you get used to hearing his voice, you, it's, it's so clear. And, you know, Christ alluded to this when he said, you know, the sheep know the master's voice, their master's voice. And they won't follow somebody else's voice. They only follow the voice of the master they know, There's the shepherd they know. So in time, with an experience, it'll be like that for you. Wonderful. So how does one learn the discernment? of that um, when the ego is actually fighting that in the beginning? Is there something, is there a signpost or a landmark that we can go by? Sure, there's lots of, there's lots of giveaways, like one, using a lot of words, one, exonerating mm-hmm. you and blaming others. That's very mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've seen that you know, before. Yeah, it, it kind of presents itself like a lawyer trying to get you off or something sometimes. You, you have the right to talk to that person that way. They said something wrong. That kind of stuff is totally egoism. But the guardian angel doesn't do that. It loves you and it loves your enemy. So it's not going to be saying something against somebody else or revealing some dirt on somebody else. So that's one. Of, that's just the most obvious one. So again, so that's, and just experience. That's, and it's just like anything else. A lot of the time, you it's just like we learn by trial and error, unfortunately, too much. And so sometimes you'll make a mistake and you'll follow the wrong voice and you'll have a, it won't come out right. And you'll go, oh, I see. I was listening to the wrong voice. But when you listen to the right voice, it comes out really good. I'll give you a little example that happened to me when I was 22. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had this inspiration to build a house. And I was living in the forest in southern Indiana. And I wanted to build it out of logs. And I was laying in bed one morning, and I was thinking, where am I going to get the logs to build this thing? And my guardian angel said, go and talk to this fellow you just met last week. Just out of the blue. I heard it just clear as a bell. So I got up, got in the car, truck, and went to talk to this guy, and he gave me the timber. Oh. And another time, this is, this is how I learned it, and you know, this was maybe three years later, I'm really needing work. I'm, I'm broke and I'm needing work. And so I ask, you know, God, you know, what, where, where can I get some work? And the guardian angel again comes and says, go to this electrical supply house. And so I'm thinking, oh, I'll go to this electrical supply house. I'll ask them for a job and, you know, let's see what happens. So I go there. The owner comes out. There's a fellow standing next to me on my left. The owner comes out and I said, do you have any work? I really could use some work. 
<laughs> and the owner says, no, I don't. And then he points to the guy next to me and says, how about you? Do, you? do you need any work? Do you need any helpers? And the guy says, oh, yeah, I'm always needing helpers. But I was so blind, I had it in my mind that it was going to be the, the, the uh, electrical company that I didn't, I missed the queue. But there was the job oh. right there for me. So, Interesting. Yeah. It, it's, it's very reliable once you get into the point where you can hear it. Now, sometimes they won't answer. And you can ask, and it seems so serious for you, and they won't answer. Why right. that? It's sort of like when you're in school, you go along in your, in your course for the year or the semester, and you can ask the teacher questions and he answers. You ask the teacher's questions and he answers. So you learn the material. But then you get to the final test, and you, ask, mm-hmm. you can ask the question. You have to give your own answer. And it works like that with this, this system as well. You know, sometimes they just stay silent because it's time for you to answer. They don't want you to become dependent on them. They're just there to guide and guard you. That's incredibly profound. I, that's something I really hadn't thought about in that context. Um, mm-hmm. So I had, if you don't mind, I have one more question. Um, actually, I have two, but probably I should just get along with one. No, you um, go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, are, are you sure? Yeah, okay. because most um, of the people that well, were calling were just calling to listen. So we've got room now. I mean, so go ahead. As I did last time, I'm so sorry. Well, one of, one of the other questions I had was, you know, we have our holy guardian angel, and um, uh, then we have the archangel, and we have the archangels, and we have uh, the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God. To whom should we pray, and to whom should we pray for what? And 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 the reason I give, and I'm going to give a very short explanation of why I'm asking this question for a little bit of background. Um, I have recently found, I did not even know the concept of archangels until mid-year last year when I prayed uh, in a, an emergency situation uh, to uh, Michael and, and Raphael and got immediate results. Um, during a period during my youth, I, I prayed to Holy Mary or to the Spirit and, and got guidance in many cases. Um, and I've just now gotten used to the idea of having a, or, or been introduced to the idea of having a holy, holy guardian angel. And, of course, everyone knows about God and everyone knows about Jesus. So to whom should one pray and for what reason? And this is not an efficiency sort of question, but um, the efficacy sort of question, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, just think about this. The archangels are at one with God. Christ is God manifested. Right. Mother Mary is one with God. So really, in any, you can pray to whoever you feel most attracted to pray to because the, the answer is going to be the same because they're all okay. coming from the same place. It's all coming that was from my, the same place. That was my intuition. It was just very unusual for me to get an almost an immediate response from, an, from the archangels as opposed to, um, but it could have been just that it was a heightened um, uh, situation as well. And then my third question was, um, about tarot, and I know this sounds sort of odd, and and perhaps um, some of some of the podcast um, um, uh, listeners are interested in tarot, and and I have been for a long time. Um, but Crowley mentioned um, that the seventy eight tarot cards were quote unquote living entities. And in the context of what Daskalos and others have said about, um, and, and Theosophy, about, about there being actual um, uh, elementals and Crowley mentioning that the 78 tarot cards are actually living beings, is this actually so? And, and what is your opinion on this? And what, do you, what is your opinion about tarot? And what is your opinion about people using it? Is it, is it safe? Is it not? Um, is it helpful? Is it not? Um, and indeed are the 78 cards of the entity. Okay. Well, you know, there's, there's times just from my own experience where I've been with people who've used tarot, and it feels like, you know, they're getting divine guidance through the tarot. 
And there's times where there are people I feel like they're using it, and it feels more like terror cards, the way they interpret it. So what yeah. it is, is, is it has to do with the person interpreting it. A teacher okay. teaching is only as high as the teacher giving it. I mean, you have the greatest teaching in the world, but if that guy doesn't understand it, he's given you something less than, than as high as the teaching. So all these people, uh, hand, palm readers, all these things, they're getting a lot of this stuff intuitively. And it could be from a good source, but it could be from an elemental source too. So we always right. have to be discerning. That's why, you know, we should just seek that, that holy guardian within us. He, he, can, he can't fail. We cannot fail. We can fail by under, misunderstanding him. Like I gave you my story where I didn't understand what was, what was going on, but he cannot fail. So trust that. Develop, this that, is what, develop that dialogue and trust that relationship. And it's just, like a, it's just like meeting a friend. You start to meet a friend, you get to know them, you get a little closer, you get to know them more. It's exactly like that with the Archangel. Okay, I'm going to sneak in one fourth question, which is a follow-up to the last, which is based upon a conversation that I had with a friend today um, about discernment and about praying for discernment. Um, how do we know that we're gaining discernment and not going astray? Is it just because we feel more whole and more uh, effective, or, or is there some other guidepost that we can use to sort of look and see that we're actually gaining discernment and, and our prayers for discernment are being answered? Well, it really has to do with developing the ability to recognize the true from the false discernment. You know, in, in, in Hindu system, they, they talk about these masters, the Paramahansana, Yogana, mm -hmm. Paramahansana Ramakrishna. They call him Paramahansana. What's Paramahansana? It means the great swan the great swan. And the reason they call him that is because in their mythology, this great swan had the ability to have a saucer of milk mixed with water, and they could drink out the milk and leave the water, which represents hmm. you know, perfect discernment. You know, that's you know, right. a myth. But it's, it gives us the idea of how we have to discern the false from the true. And honestly, it takes takes a lot of experience, and there's going to be mistakes, and that's how you learn. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Only God doesn't make mistakes, and mistakes is how we learn the truth. You know, like somebody says, don't put your hand close to the stove. And you do, and then you learn. Okay, you got the burn, but you learn. So we have uh, these plenty of experiences where we have these, we mistake discernment, I mean, we mistake, uh, you know, a message from the guardian angel when it's really from something else, or we misdiscern right. something based on our own predilation. So this is back to introspection. You've got to know yourself, know your weaknesses, because then, then, you start to, then you can start to see how you can be tricked by your egotism leading you toward what you already think is true or what you already want. Oh, that's, you know, it's, it's, that's the answer, you know, and you get misled that way. So if you know yourself, you won't be able to be misled. So that just takes time and introspection. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you for all that you did to answer the questions um, on the Salt Miners community and, and also here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. All right. And that was great questions. Uh, you know, Dave actually messaged me because I'm getting some messages, too, about that. And I was thinking the same thing. You know, when we pray – does it go through our guardian angel or does it go to God or maybe we have this uh, black and white mentality about it all. And it's really all the same thing. And isn't that what you were saying earlier? Well, it's like the guardian angel can't say anything that God wouldn't say to you. And you know, the guardian angel is an emissary from the Holy spirit and the Holy spirit is God. You know, the Holy spirit is just one expression of God, just like the logo says and God, the father, those are three expressions from one God. So the holy archangels are an emissary of the Holy Spirit. So they can't say anything that God wouldn't say. And, of course, that's nothing that Christ wouldn't say. So it's, they're all drawn from the same truth. All right. And, but uh, how we interpret it is where we get in trouble. Right. And I was going to tell her that, you know, I, I was going to ask you the same thing about the tarot. But the only thing that I've found that it, 
as far as tarot goes, I don't really think it's that great for divination, but Paul Foster Case is probably the best book I've ever read about it. It's just and Arthur Edward Waite, which was a Christian mystic, but there's so many. I see what you're saying. I mean, why even mess with it sometimes when you can just go straight to the source, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's far the, the effort you make to, I mean, you're guarding, that's, this is his job and this is what he wants. And you know how happy they are when we turn inward and start to seek this kind of guidance? Oh, it gives them joy. Joy to your angels in heaven. For when it returns home, that means returns back All right. to yourself. Well, that's, uh, man, this is good stuff here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a small break uh, for me and Daniel. <laughs> and if you want to call in, it's 831 to ask a question. It's 831-777-8643, which that spells uh, void. And uh, we will be right back after this short break. Is lighting the void radio with your host joseph roop it's the show about truth seeking and freeing the spirit shattering your limited beliefs revealing hidden truths and much much more in your face all over the place we're online 24 7 24 7 your I'm Cheryl Trainer for KTLK, the Fringe FM News. According to Seeker.com, floating libertarian city gets a step closer to reality. Peter Thiel, billionaire co-founder of PayPal, helped launch the Seasteading Institute. Floating cities free from government meddling. No regulation, no taxes. That would be the testing grounds for technological, social and political innovation. This past January... The dream came one step closer to reality when the Seastead Institute signed a deal with French Polynesia that lays the legal groundwork for the world's first semi-autonomous floating city-state. The long-term vision of Seasteading is to construct fully autonomous floating cities on the high seas where the next generation of pioneers can peacefully test new ideas for government. But for this first proof-of-concept project, the Seasteading Institute was searching for an island partner with protected shallow waters and an openness to new type of economic model called a sea zone. Seasteading advocates envision a future where clusters of offshore communities serve as green foils to polluting coastal cities. The excess CO2 pumped out by cities can be captured by sprawling offshore algae farms and converted into biofuels. Nutrients leached away by wastewater can be used to fertilise floating vegetable farms and fisheries. The Seasteading Institute is interested in taking incremental steps toward more autonomy so people can experiment with new societies. The technological innovation and legal innovation are advancing in parallel towards a long-term view of moving out to the high seas. This is Cheryl Trainer, KTLK News. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Tired of running up your cell phone bill with data over just listening to internet radio? Well, the Fringe FM has the solution. Just use our Audio Now line by calling 563-999-3921. That's 563-999-3921 from any phone. This is Reverend John M. Polk from johnpolkmedia.com, and you are listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. This is Lighting the Void Radio with your host, Joseph Root. This is Dave Cruz with Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. All right, and we're back. Thanks for letting us take that break. I really appreciate that, you guys. Um, And I'm sure Daniel does, too. Um, So uh, is there anything that you have on your mind that you'd like to speak about, Daniel, before we take uh, another caller? Because I know we're kind of just blowing through this stuff here. Uh, No, I'm, I'm okay. We can just go straight to the calls. Okay, all right. 
I've got some messages, a message from Facebook from uh, one of the group guys that wants me to ask you a question, too. So I'll get to that, uh, Jonas, I promise. All right, here we go. Let's see. Uh, 970 area code. Do you have a question for Daniel? Actually, I do. Yeah, hi, Daniel. This is Kate. I was reading in the Esoteric Practices book recently that Daskalos was suggesting that people meditate in any part of the world, wherever they are at 9 o'clock at night, as a sort of a group effort. Um, do you know if people are still doing that? And if so, is there any particular focus or meditation that might be preferable for people to do? Uh, yeah, that's that's definitely going on, and it was going on even before Daskalos meant, mentioned that. It's the masters of the White Lodge, the high ascended masters, have given this practice where we d- visualize the pink light flooding the planet, and we all do it in our time zone at 9 o'clock, And you can imagine, now try to imagine the Earth from space and seeing this pink light just wrap around the planet. So it's constantly wrapping around the planet. So it's it's a very, very good thing. And and the way Daskalos describes it in the esoteric practices is, you know, just all you need to know. And just, but the most important thing with any of these prayers or practices is that you really give it your your best heart. And you don't put tension in it, but you, you really show up to do this practice. Great. Okay, thank you. And how long do you suggest people do it for? I mean, at a minimum, maximum, any guidelines there? Oh, that kind of thing, you know, for 15 minutes is fine. You know, you don't need to do it any longer than that. Okay. All right, so. great. Great, thank you. Look forward, and I look forward to seeing you in Sedona. Are there any, anything else that you can give? Any other, like, little uh, teasers you can give us about the Sedona workshop that's coming up? <laughs> You're going to really like it. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, sounds good. Okay, see you, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Bye. All right, thanks for your question, Kate. That was a good question. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it out there, Daniel. But I would love to. I mean, that looks like it's going to be something really, really fun. It's like it's three days. Is that right? Uh, yeah. We're, well, we're going to meet. Uh, have a meeting the night before, and then we're going to do three days of a workshop. And then on the fourth day, I like to go out with everybody and do something fun. So we're going to uh, hike in the desert, and another group, it's a little braver, going to climb Bell Rock Mountain, which is one of the so-called energy vortexes of Sedona, Arizona. Oh, that's cool. Um, I had no idea. I don't know why I haven't read that, but I had no idea about that meditation. That is really, really cool. Uh, the pink light that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, there's a lot of people doing that worldwide. And they have been for many, many years. So, yeah, join in if you can. It's just, we need, we need this world needs light, as we all know. And it doesn't take a horoscope or a microscope to realize that, you know, this world needs our prayers, our light, our compassion, our tolerance, all these things. Most importantly, our love. There's no doubt about that. Uh, no doubt. Um, okay, 818 area code. Do you have a question for Daniel Joseph? Hello, yeah. Uh, this is Joanna. Hey, Joanna. Uh, I would like to. Hi, Daniel. Yeah. I just want to ask uh, Daniel about uh, the practices because I've been reading uh, the Stylus book and I want to know if. Uh, um, how do I know if I'm doing it right? And how do I know if uh, I'm, uh, uh, what do you call this? I, I'm moving on with my, my practices, or I'm doing mm-hmm. uh, good with my practices. Mm-hmm. Well, the proof's in the pudding, as they say. In other words, mm-hmm. you should start to have an effect. You should start to feel good when you do these things. Mm-hmm. Feel more balanced, more calm. Things will be mm-hmm clearer you know that's the proof that you're doing it and as you advance mm-hmm. in the practices one thing you notice since most of them are visualizations is mm-hmm. your visualizations get better they become clearer the colors become brighter and you feel more mm-hmm. connected with the practice you're doing so just watch internally the effect these things are having on you and that'll mm-hmm. be your guide mm-hmm. okay um i uh wow that's great uh uh yeah, um, I'm also doing the visualization, but uh, what's happening to me is that uh, while visualizing certain color, um, there's uh, this uh, negative 
thought that's coming up uh, to me, and that 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 stops me from doing the visualization. And how do I how do I overcome that, or how do I? Yeah, um, that's 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 a very good point because no matter what practice you're doing, whether it's our system or any other system, the first thing that happens is you sit down to meditate, sit down to visualize, sit down to pray. Mm -hmm. What happens? Mm -hmm. These thoughts come rising up from our subconscious, good, bad, or ugly. They, they distract us. They interfere yeah. with what mm -hmm. you as an as a individual have set yourself to do. I'm going to sit here and meditate now. And you sit down, the first thing that happens, these thoughts start coming. So we have to learn the ability to close the door to our subconscious because this is where these thoughts are coming from. Oh, and so yeah. You just have to, to just master it and just the most important thing is don't think the thought through. And that's how oh, you master it. So mm -hmm. you you know the thought will come up and you and you, you don't want to think it through. There'll be sometimes you'll be meditating and you have the thought will come so strong when you're first doing meditation that I've seen people just stand right up because they're so mm -hmm. used to obeying the thoughts coming from their own subconscious. So one of the practices we do to recognize what our elementals are in which is the same mm -hmm. as these thoughts and emotions coming from the subconscious, is you mm -hmm. just sit down and for maybe 10 minutes a day for one week, you just mm -hmm. let them, you watch them come up. You don't follow them. You don't try to suppress them. You just let them come up. And then you'll see all these thoughts, all these feelings, all these ideas, these are my elementals. This is what the elementals are. So for that wow. first week, just become aware of them. Then the second week mm -hmm. is you, 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 when they come up, you just pull your attention away from it. Pull your attention away from it. And if you do this practice oh, for a few uh, weeks, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. become strong enough to, to close that door yourself to the subconscious. So I, I don't stop. Once that thought comes up, uh, I don't stop uh, doing what I'm doing and just, uh, observe it. just observe it until it's done. The, well, in the first week, you just watch it. You just watch it oh, come. Okay. It'll think this. It'll try to get you to stand up and go do this. Oh, you got to call this. You got to get the oil changed in the car. It's all these mute and meaningless ways. This is what Christ is talking about, the mute and meaningless spirits. These are them. All these uh -huh. mundane things that just distract and fill our mind with stuff that's not mm -hmm. that important. This sure there's time to do it, but you know, to get to the oil change in your car, but not when you're meditating. You know, that's the time you've reserved for yourself. Claim that. This is your sacred ground. Claim it. Yeah. yeah. If you don't claim it, no one else is going to claim it for you. That's true, yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Wow. Okay. I will do it. Because that's, <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes it just stops me from, from doing the meditation because, oh my God, this touch comes up and that stops me. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for... But the, but the, uh, the aim of it is to become a master of your thoughts mm -hmm. and emotions. And it, this is how you do it. And it's, you have, it doesn't matter how long it takes. This is what you have to do until you can become the master of your thoughts and emotions. And when you do that, what you're doing is pulling the energy out of these useless ones so that when you put them into a positive one, those are much stronger. Yeah. I have the same yeah. problem. I have yeah. crazy thoughts sometimes. As soon as if, <laughs> as soon as it feels like my mind is calming down, I'll start having just weird thoughts come in my head, and I'm like, "What, what yeah, is that?" Yeah, yeah. You know, I wouldn't even think about mm -hmm. some of that stuff. So it's, I don't know if those yeah. are elementals or is that what those are, Daniel? Yeah. Well, sure, they're elementals. They're thought forms, oh. thoughts and emotions. And it's it, quite honestly, when you start to meditate and you go deep. It's like it's just exactly like swimming in the ocean because you're going deep, and now it's the subconscious mind and the conscious mind works like this. Imagine an ocean. The surface of the ocean is the conscious mind. Everything underneath the ocean is the subconscious, and there are lots of things living down in that, um, that deep part of the ocean, and the deeper you go, the stranger the creatures look. In the real ocean, it's the same way in our subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have any other questions for Daniel? Oh, ah, that's all, Daniel. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank Good you. Bye bye. Uh, okay. Bye bye. All right. Great questions. That's really great questions. Um, and if any of you guys want to check out some of this stuff, you can go to uh, Daniel's book, which is the whale.us, and 
the salt miners community on Facebook, they actually have lessons in there and the books to get from Daskalos that start from the beginning all the way um, to, I believe we're on lesson 19 right now. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you just want to join that group, you can actually go down to the bottom and start from the very beginning. It's really, really cool. Um, I have a question here that is came through. I have a couple of questions that came through the messenger. One is from Jonas, who's part of the group, and he's going to school uh, for uh, osteopathy, and he and he wants to finish his training in physics as well. And he says it's very expensive, and he don't know if he'll be able to pay it. Which I I, I bet it's really expensive. Is it okay to create an elemental which will help him? through it or afford it possibly sure sure it's, as long as it's a noble cause it's not something dark of course and this is a noble cause so yes it's definitely okay now i was at Daskalos one time and i was feeling the same kind of thing like i really needed money and i asked him and he said well this is what i do i don't think about so much about you know i don't use my lower mind to think about how to go and get the money I see myself, I visualize myself having the thing I want. So in this case, Jonas, I would suggest you visualize yourself in these schools. See yourself graduating. See yourself with the thing you want to achieve. And that sets forth forth elementals that try to go about and bring those things about. So, yes, definitely. You can use that for your own benefit. Okay. And then... Um, George wants to know, uh, and he would just called in earlier, but he wants to know, um, if our spirit is with God permanently, are we all saved? So he wants to know that question. Are, are every one of us saved and therefore our soul experiences? Not as a personality. Not as a personality. We're not saved. We're in the, we're in the, in the process of Saving the personality. What's that mean, saving the personality? What is salvation? Right. Who gets saved? Well, obviously, it's not the spirit. It's already one with God. Obviously, not the soul. It's one with God. Not even the permanent personality, which is the soul. Sometimes they call it the soul personality because it's the one that projects the ray down into existence. So it's it's straddling that. You know, the pure soul is on top of the line and one with God, but the permanent personality is on the other side of the line and projects the ray down that becomes the backbone of our personality. So even down here is the most sinful personality in the world. That backbone is a ray of perfect spirit. And we think about it like this. You think about, you know, we, we, you know the teachings that we have the three bodies, the emotional body, the mental body, and the physical body. Right. So try to imagine a light bulb and you put one shade on it. That represents the noetical body. Then you put another shade on it. It represents the psychical body. You put another shade on it. It represents the physical body. Well, if these shades are dark, not much light comes through. So our job is to clean the shades so the light comes through pure in existence while we have our physical body, emotional body, and mental body. So the light is never harmed. It doesn't, the light doesn't hurt the light to have a black shade on it, does it? No. <laughs> So in the same way, we're not affecting the spirit soul. We're not affecting, we're affecting our inner self by the behaviors of the personality. The personality suffers that, but the soul doesn't suffer. Right. And he's looking for, since you did answer his question, which thank you for that. And so he says with that answer, therefore our soul experiences here have what meaning what are we what's it for that's a big question actually that's i just i just yeah i just i just said it before experience, it's, right this, we have to go through these experiences so we can get the understanding of time space the worlds of duality and we're in the densest of all the worlds of, rea- of, of duality and when your material body p- dies and you you as a self-awareness pass over to continue the same life but just in a higher plane of existence, you start to feel more like your soul and less like the personality, even though in the psychical plane, it's still a world of illusion. But it's just not as it, the illusions are much more pleasing and much more true than this world. And then, again, noetical world, even more so. 
So our experiences down here enrich us so that we understand the truth of all the worlds of existence as well as beingness. When we were in beingness as a spirit soul, as we are now, there's no confusion. Right. It's down here where we get confused in the worlds of duality because it's a world of illusion. I, I didn't want to double ask that question, Daniel, but I've heard George ask that kind of question on here a few times. And I myself are, you know, so we all ask that question, right? What's this about? You know? So thanks for, yeah, for that. Absolutely. Um, okay. So let's see, we're about an hour in. I think we can take a call here. All right. Um, six one five area code. Go ahead with Daniel Joseph. Hello, this is Caroline again. I, I just wanted to follow up to, um, I, I was going back through my notes and was wondering if there were any questions that I hadn't asked that I sort of did burning questions that we have. Um, I, I have a question um, for Daniel. Um, Dasko has mentioned that negative, negative elementals that we have created always return to us. And that some of them, especially if they're powerfully negative towards other people, can sometimes be felt as a constricting feeling around our own hearts. My question is, is it possible to blanket negate all of the negative elementals that we created before we knew what their power actually was um, and what the, what the effect would be? Um, that were sent out from us from coming back to us or harming other people that we sent them out to? You have to disenergize them, and you, there, there's no way to escape them. We, because these are created by us, they have the right to return to us. You know, I send out mm. an elemental, it's not going to return to you. It's not going to return to Joseph. It's going to return to me. If it's a good elemental, it benefits me. If it's a negative elemental, it harms me. And if you have it for other people... The way these elementals work, this is a little bit deep in the teaching, but I'll tell you anyway. It's when the okay. elemental goes out of a human being, it goes out of the third eye, it's the size yeah. of the pin. It gets into the real, the psychical environment, it becomes a full shape. And it goes and it strikes them. Let's say it's a bad elemental. And it strikes on that person. Let's say, I don't like that person. I, I don't, I, you know, say something negative about somebody. That elemental goes with unerring accuracy instantly, no matter where they are on the planet, they get hit by it. Now, most people aren't aware of their etheric double, so they don't notice it. But what happens, the elemental hits them. What happens next? If it's a person who has some negativity in them themselves, the elemental splits in two. It doesn't become weaker. It just becomes two. And one goes in that person because they vibrate in harmony with it, and the other goes back to the creator and harms the creator. What happens if that strikes a pure person? You have a negative thought about a saint. It doesn't split in two. It just simply bounces off and comes back to the person that's in it. Brilliant. So we, have, we are responsible for it. So we have to disintegrate them. You know, they, they're ours, but they're not us. So we have the right and the power, once you learn it, to, you know, just take the, take the energy out of these things and then they become inactive. But yeah, so, not to disenergize themselves. So we so we have to disenergize them, and we also can protect ourselves from other people by basically having a pure heart. Absolutely, the pure heart it won't hurt anybody. That's why that's what I was saying about the saint. It just it bounces off. It doesn't go into them because they don't have that thing inside that would resonate in harmony that would allow it to attach. You know, it's all about energy and vibrational rates. The way these things and are. I, and I think I, I'm very sensitive, so I guess my follow-up question to that would be, it, 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 can it be something as simple as just sort of a, a flash of a negative emotion, such as jealousy or envy, or does it have to be something that's fully thought out, like, you know, an, a, a, uh, an intention for revenge or an intention for someone to be ill or have an accident? Yeah, the more they're thought out, the more damaging and the more powerful they are. But you create them whether you're, you're subconsciously. I mean, just driving down the road, just look at the car next to you and it's not driving right. And you just don't even say anything. You don't, don't even have much. You don't even really form the thought, but you have a right. feeling about it or something. It's, it's still happening. But it's not as dangerous as one where, you, you know, you really calculate with your mind and plan to harm that person. Now, on the same token, 
the ones you create that are positive are much more stronger when they're full ah. of thought than they are more more of thought than of emotion. So, so these are laws uh, governing all this, and they work for good or evil, either way. It's just a matter of how we're using them, consciously or subconsciously. Like, it's just like physics, then. It's just it's, it's for every action, there's a positive or negative reaction. Um, there's there's an equal and opposite reaction, um, uh, or equal equal action, I should say, but maybe not opposite reaction. I guess when I was talking about whether something was thought out or not, a previous caller was mentioning something about, you know, um, how how does one get uh, to the point where they can, you know, meditate and actually start, you know, destroying some of these negative thought processes that keep them from having a clearer mind and the ability to sort of focus. Um, uh, and, and to destroy, you know, these elemental... Uh, or, or keep them from happening. And so one one of the things you mentioned earlier was that in the first week you notice, you meditate, you notice the uh, the thoughts coming in, but you just notice them. And then by the second week, you're essentially noticing them, but you keep from thinking those thoughts through. And so essentially... I guess what I picked up from that, I guess it's a little bit of feedback, and then a question after that would be, my feedback would be, wow, so what you're saying is we can, you know, really start beginning to uh, control our negative thought processes and our pos- and creating positive thought processes in two weeks, <laughs> you know, which is, which is, you know, we can begin, we can't essentially end, but we can begin doing that within two weeks, which is encouraging to all of us. And then the second thing would be, um, you know, when do we, when do we, when do we know, or when do we get to a signpost of when that becomes sort of um, uh, instinctual instead of being, instead of being something that we have to really focus on? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and when do we know that? Very- let me be very clear. Once an elemental is created, you can't destroy it. There's right. no way to destroy one because they're made of mind, and that mind is eternal. So what the only thing we can do is just take the power out of them so we can kill the power in them. That's what we're killing. You can't kill the elemental. And when you kill the power in the elemental, it leaves you and goes back into this cosmic consciousness. You can send it back into the cosmic consciousness by de-energizing it. But a lot of people stop thinking about the elementals, but they're still settled down in their subconsciousness. So hmm. we have, as you advance, there, there will be practices given to you which will clean those dead works from the subconsciousness, too. Okay. So the way okay, okay so, so there are other, so what you're saying is, essentially, is that there are other processes besides just noticing them, not thinking them through, that those initial um, uh, actions that you do, there are many other steps in order to get to the point where you are doing other such things, as, such as deactivating the elementals that you may have caused or may have picked up from other people or your environment. So there's, it's, it's, it's much more complex than just noticing them, um, uh, keeping from thinking through your own thoughts. There's also, there are also other steps which are, you know, taking elementals that you've been exposed to and may have embedded themselves in you, into you parasitically that you may not be, even be aware of that will come up during that process. Is that, is that so? Well, it's, it's simpler than that. I mean, what I'm telling you to begin with, with this, just watching them come up and then, you know, don't follow them, don't suppress them, just watch what kind you have. And then the second week, just when they come up, just immediately stop thinking about them. That's pulling the energy out of them. That'll get you mastery over the point where you can meditate without being disturbed. That'll happen right now. Wow. But okay. What, I, what I'm telling you, there's still a residue that's left, like, and we call it dead works. And they're just dead. They're, they're inactive, but they're still in us. And so all it takes is a little thought on them, and they come right back alive. So we want to get even those dead ones out of us. And the way you do that is it's going to be a higher teaching later on with, I mean, a higher level of practices to clean the subconsciousness with these etheric currents that the Hindus call Ida and Pingala. 
mm-hmm. two currents. So that's an advanced thing. But right now, you can't get to there until you do this other step first, which is to certainly recognize your own elementals, know what they are, and disempower them. And what will happen is you'll you'll practice and you'll get pretty good, and then you'll forget about it, and you'll start living your life, and then it'll all come back again, and you'll have to do it again. Pretty soon, you start to realize what's happening instinctually, like you're saying. <clears throat> and you'll just do it instinctually. You'll know not that you'll start to have a negative. So I said, no, silence. You just stop it before it even completes. And then it becomes extinct, instinctual. But still, even after that, in a higher level, we give this practice to clean out these dead words. It's like anything else. It's like, you know, you burn a fire in the fireplace. Sooner or later, you have to take out the ashes. You know, mm-hmm. you live in your house, you eat food, you have to take out the trash, you know. So these this cleansing of the subconsciousness is like taking the trash out of your house. That's very interesting. Well, thank you so much again. You're welcome. Thanks, Caroline. All right. So we, if you guys have any questions, uh, we need to start kind of wrapping it up. We're over an hour now. And, um, and I know you're getting a lot on your plate, Daniel. Uh, but I have a question that has to do with um, the later, the past lessons that we've been talking about in the group. And it's from David. And uh, okay. he says, he says, thanks for hosting, Daniel. And, and he thank you for coming on the show. And you're welcome, man. I appreciate that. But he says, I work with many people who are ill or in physical pain. In my attempt to help them, I create loving, etheric balls of light in an attempt to help and heal these people. Sometimes an image of a white light comes to my mind, but at other times this ball is blue or white and gold streaks. So his question is, is it appropriate to send balls of light to these people without first asking them, uh, is it this isn't always appropriate is what he's wanting to know, I guess. And what do you make of the balls being different colors depending on the people that I'm seeing? That The fact that it's different colors, I would trust that. I feel that's your guardian angel, and that's what they do. They help you understand what they need, but you'll see the color, so you know that person needs that color. Now, that's a good. the other point was a good question, too. Do we have the right to help other people if we don't have their permission? Yes and no. You you really can't get into their life and interfere, but anyone can pray for somebody. Anyone can bless somebody. Anyone can send people light to help them. But if you're trying to fix something in them, then that's you as a personality working, and that's not permitted unless they ask you for your help. But at a higher level, just think about this. What really the power comes from is when you can do this thing, when your personality is so aligned or so so calm, let's say that, that it becomes translucent to the effort of your soul. In other words, the soul can come through it. And when the soul is, the soul has, is not in danger of making any mistakes, so it can work on anybody without their permission. But you, it takes a lot to know the difference between your personality and the soul at this point, because we, right now we've got them confused, and you can't tell always in the beginning when it's coming from your soul and when it's coming from your personality unless you do the introspection to be able to separate the two. So there's never a time when we're not doing the introspection. That's something we got to do always, right? Yeah. I'm, and it, yeah. And initially, you know, the practice is given at the end of the every day you do it. But what happens in real, real world is you, you know, you do that for a while. And then pretty soon you start to, you, you have these experiences. And then right after the experience, you'll think, oh, gee, I, I, I really shouldn't have done it. You start just automatically introspecting on what just happened. If something goes wrong or you say something that's not, it maybe hurts somebody or isn't the right thing to say in the moment. And you'll, you'll do the introspection right after that happens. But then the next stage is you do it in real time. So while you're talking to somebody, maybe you know you don't, you, you have ill feelings for this person and you, you want to, you, then you start watching yourself. You make sure you don't subconsciously just express those. Then the final stage is when you You'll do it in advance. So, like, you'll see, you'll see somebody coming. You're going to meet them, and you know there's these issues there. So you do your introspection. You start to become conscious so you don't fall into the, into the same patterns. So it happens uh, in, like, four stages like that, I would say. All right. And uh, let's see. Jonah wants to know, 
Uh, could you tell a bit about how your own practices and skills and using the ethers have evolved over the course of time? He says his progress in visualization is so hard and slow, and I find it motivating to hear any success stories. So he kind of wants to hear your your evolution of this, or how have you evolved in these teachings? Um, well, one of the mottos Daskalos gave us is reveal nothing and promise nothing. So we don't really like talking about our own experiences except to maybe draw a point on a certain aspect of the teaching maybe. But just trust yourself, Jonas. Trust yourself. And over time, slowly, slowly, it'll start coming together. And you can, you'll, the experience happens like this for everybody. You'll, you'll be visualizing and it's, it's cloudy, it's unstable, it's not super bright. Maybe it's even got some shadowy colors to it or something. And then all of a sudden, boom, you'll see it just as clear as a bell, like a computer draw, drew it in terms of perfection as well as the perfection of the color, perfection of the shape as well as the color. Those are good signs. They come. It takes practice. Just lots of practice. But when you get that, then you, you become very, you have a very powerful tool for helping yourself and other fellow human beings. So it's worth it. All right. And uh, I think we probably, it's getting kind of late with for you, Daniel, so I think we probably need to uh, wrap this up. Uh, do you have any departing words for the audience and all the people listening? Uh, we got listeners from all over right now, so uh, or about the event or anything you just want to say before we let you go. Um. You know, I, I, I'll speak a little more to Jonas' thing. You know, if he asks for something, I, I'll say a little something. And, you know, I think this is everybody's experience, and it was certainly brought out tonight, that um, you, know, you start to sit down and you meditate, and your mind drives you crazy, you know. And slowly over time, if you practice, practice, as, as I did, eventually you start to be able to hold your mind in this steady state without the elementals come up. And you go in, I've gone into samadhis because you've stopped that process alone. And you enter the state called, um, I don't know what the Hindus call it, some sort of level of samadhi, but you feel like you're not breathing. And there's been so many times where I, it's like a, you think it's been 20 minutes, it's been an hour and 20 minutes on the deep ones, although we're not supposed to practice the visualizations that long. But in a, in a concentrated meditation with still point concentration where there's no thought or anything, it goes and long, it just goes. And you think it's 20 minutes, been an hour and 20 minutes or something. And those states are really, you know, reachable by the, these teachings. So I just encourage Jonas and everybody listening just to persevere. Keep on keeping on with your practice. And it will produce. And a lot of people, I'll say this. This is one last thing I want to close with. You know, we all... Have you know a certain phase of our life we're seekers and we're seeking the truth, and so we try this system, we try this meditation, we try that practice, we try this. But a researcher of truth is someone who's found the truth. Now they got to dig deep and research it. So what I see too much in the world is people starting a practice, and then after some months or a year or something, they try some other practice, and then they try some other practice, and this is like a man. Two men going out to dig a well, and they both go out and they dig a hundred shovels fulls. One guy digs a hundred shovels fulls in one spot and hits water. The other guy goes around, digs a couple shovel fulls, and moves on. Digs a couple shovel fulls, and at the end of this time, he's done a dug a hundred shovel fulls and found no water. And the other guy found it. So dig deep. Find when you feel a connection, whether it's this one or this system or something else, stay with it and go deep because that's what produces the result. All right. Some good advice. And uh, I really want to, uh, again, thank you for coming out, Dan. Y'all know this is your uh, third time coming to the show. And I got to say, I interview a lot of people on here from a lot of different uh, beliefs and faiths and practices. And, you know, we're on a network that even has some adulter type shows. And there's a lot of stuff out there in the world. But I can tell the audience right now, I've been seeking since I was 18 years old. And I have not found anything that strikes my soul and my heart 
more than these teachings right here. And I will stay with them probably for the rest of my life. So if anybody is listening on the podcast or if you listen to this later on iTunes or Google Play podcast or whatever, it's if you have any questions about truth, I think this is this is where it's at. That's just my opinion. And I, I do want to thank you again, Daniel, for, for coming out. It means a lot. Well, thank you for having me, Joseph, and uh, thanks for everybody calling in and with their interest in this wonderful teachings we have in our laps here. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's really awesome. All right, guys, that's the end of it. And, uh, you know, next week we're going to have something uh, really cool on, too. We're bringing in a doctor. His name is Dr. Scott Kolbaba, and he is going to talk about his book and his own witnesses to actual miracles right there you know, in the medical room. So that's going to be pretty interesting. And, and, uh, thanks again, Daniel, for coming out. I hope, I hope you can come back when you, when you're not busy. I sure will. Good night, everybody. Good night guys.